Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we'll be talking about storage classes and how they can be used for dynamic provisioning of volumes in Kubernetes. So let's jump into the content. First of all, what we need to look at is persistent volumes and PVCs. I have covered this in my storage introduction video, but just to get us back into that frame of mind, um, we'll quickly jump over kind of how they work from a thousand foot view and then uh, we'll then dive into how storage classes can use to make this uh, situation a little bit simpler. First of all, a pod references a PVC. A PVC references a persistent volume. PVC obviously persistent volume claim and a persistent volume creates the underlying storage. So this diagram illustrates that we will have created a persistent volume. That persistent volume will be referenced by a persistent volume claim. And then the persistent volume claim will be referenced by the pod. And by creating these uh, Kubernetes API objects, we'll have a pod that will be able to read and write to some uh, storage device that has been defined in the persistent volume. And then uh, that persistent volume has been bound um, to the pod via the persistent volume claim. Now, there are a separation of concerns when it comes to persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. First of all, the Kubernetes developer will generally be responsible for the pod and the PVC. So when they want to set up their application, they're obviously going to be responsible for the pod manifest in most cases, and they will also be responsible for the persistent volume claim. However, uh, at another layer, we have uh, the underlying Kubernetes infrastructure, the storage infrastructure, and that is generally managed by the Kubernetes admin. So they will oftentimes be responsible for the PV and the underlying storage. So what this means is that when a developer needs to set up a new application, they will be uh, setting up the pod and the PVC, but that they're then going to have to make a request to the Kubernetes admin to ensure that the PV exists and the underlying storage is there that uh, meets the developer's requirements. So you could imagine, or if you've worked in a corporate environment, you will know that oftentimes uh, interactions with external teams can be quite cumbersome and slow and cause a lot of delay to your projects. So this way of working isn't necessarily the best, so the solution to this problem that we have discussed is the use of storage classes. And storage classes are essentially an abstraction layer between persistent volume claims and persistent volumes. So as the Kubernetes admin, we will define a set of classes that the Kubernetes developer will then be able to use, use based on their needs. The PVC user selects the class and they don't have to worry themselves about the details of the underlying persistent volume. They will know there are four or five different types of uh, storage class that they can reference based on the needs of their application. They will select one and that's it. There's no more uh, contacting a Kubernetes admin to set up a PV, worrying about the underlying storage. It's a clean abstraction layer for the Kubernetes developer. And it also reduces the effort for the Kubernetes admin, because as we will discuss uh, in a few uh, slides later, storage classes also facilitate dynamic provisioning. This means that the Kubernetes admin does not even have to provision the persistent volume. Uh, as once the storage class is set up, the storage class will allow for the underlying PV and the underlying storage to be provisioned dynamically with no uh, human intervention. Now let's have a look at some of the fields in the storage class. If we're going to define a storage class, this is what we'll need to think about. First of all, the provisioner. So oftentimes this will be a particular storage offering from a cloud provider. For example, here we have AWS Elastic Block Store. Next, parameters. These are specific to the provisioner. So 
uh, in this case type is GP2. Um, yeah, dependent on the provisioner, uh, these can vary. So we don't need to go into details here, but you know, when you select, if you're on, uh, you know, Azure or GCP, then you will go away. You'll find the parameters that you need and uh, specify them based on what you're actually trying to achieve with the storage class that you're creating. Next, reclaim policy. So the values allowed here are delete, retain, and recycle. And what this means is that after the uh, application that's using the persistent volume is deleted, do we either delete the persistent volume, retain the persistent volume, or recycle it? So what's the difference between retain and recycle? Well, retain means that the uh, data that the persistent volume contained is left intact. This also means that the uh, persistent volume cannot be bound to a new application immediately. It requires the Kubernetes admin to go in and uh, you know, maybe copy and then clean up the uh, directory where the data was stored. Whereas with recycle, the persistent volume data is removed and it immediately becomes available again to another application that might want to come in and use that persistent volume. Next is allow volume expansion. This will uh, define you know, whether the size of the persistent volume can grow over time. The next field and the last field we're going to discuss is volume binding mode. And this essentially indicates whether we are going to wait for the consumer, i.e. the pod, to become available prior to binding the PVC to its underlying PV. So uh, this is useful for scheduling. Um, if we have complex scheduling requirements, we may not want to bind the PV to the PVC immediately. Um, because the storage may be available in a different region to where the pod is to be scheduled. So we have to uh, wait for the consumer in that case and ensure that we are uh, meeting the scheduling requirements for the pod whilst creating the persistent volume. Um, but in most cases, we can use the default value, which is immediate, which means that the binding happens um, immediately on creation of the PV and the PVC. Now, as I had mentioned, storage classes provide dynamic provisioning of persistent volumes. So the reference to the storage class in the persistent volume claim will create the persistent volume and the underlying storage. So this eliminates effort on the part of the cluster admin, and it also provides a more user-friendly experience for the developers they only have to know about a handful of storage classes rather than having to know about the details of all of their persistent volumes. So it's a cleaner interface and there's less effort on the part of the cluster admin. And this is this diagram summarizes how that works. We have a pod. The pod references a persistent volume claim. That references a storage class and the storage class goes away and creates the persistent volume and the persistent volume will then reference or make an API call, let's say to the cloud provider, generate the storage itself, and then that will all feedback through and the pod will be set up as we wish. Now let's have a quick look at a example. We're first going to look at how this would work with uh, persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, and the pod. Um, I have created the files. We will look at the PV. This would be create first. So in this case, we're using a uh, block PV. This will reference uh, an underlying, um, potentially, let's say, elastic block store block. Now. Let's look at a quick example of how this might work in practice. First, using the original method of pod, PVC, and PV. Next, using the method of pod, storage class, and PVC.
first of all, I'm just uh, utilizing a mini cube cluster here for the purpose of the example. But um, if you were to, to use this example, it would have to be an AWS because it's the storage class I'm creating references AWS. So first of all, let's begin by creating our resources. I have the manifest defined. First is the PV. This is how it looks. We're using block storage. Um, this data here is just a unique identifier to the particular uh, piece of storage that we have created. FC means fiber channel, which is the protocol used for block storage. So first of all, let's create that. Okay, create F PV yaml okay get pv and we can see that we have created this uh, block pv and it's in the available state next let's have a look at our pvc in this case we are just simply uh, mentioning that we want 10 gigs of storage we want it to be block type and we want the access mode to be read write once which are uh, PV was also. So just create that as well. And we can see that our PVC is in a pending state. And uh, the reason that it doesn't get bound is because uh, this storage that we have referenced here, we don't actually have the underlying uh, storage devices available. So just to bear that in mind, I'm just using Minikube cluster here. This is only for the purpose of example. Finally, let's have a look at our pod manifest. In this case, we have referenced our persistent volume claim. The claim name is block PVC, as we saw before. The name of the volume is my volume. That volume is then mounted to the container in the home directory. So let's see if we can create this pod. Uh, we get rid of that and the pod is created. So now we have all of our resources set up um, and the pod should have access to that storage if the underlying storage was available. Now, how would this change if we had used a storage class? Well, our storage class is defined here in fc.yaml and our storage class is using AWS block storage and these are the parameters that we have given. Again, the parameters are uh, relevant only to the specific provisioner that we have defined. Now, if we wanted to use this storage class, then we could delete our PV. First of all, we don't need this. We can have a look at our PVC and see what we actually require in here? Well, the first thing that we need is storage class name. And that would be, one sec, it would be slow. That is the only thing that would change. We do not need to create the PV. As I mentioned, I've deleted that. And really that is the only thing that will change. So in the second scenario, what we have is our pod, which looks like this. We have our PVC, which looks like this. We have mentioned the storage class and we have our storage class and the underlying block storage will be created dynamically. We don't have to create the persistent volume and we don't have to ensure that specific pieces of storage in our underlying storage provider exist. So that is my video on storage classes. I really hope that was useful. If you have any questions, please leave a comment and I'll get straight back to you. Please like and subscribe and I will talk to you in the next video.